Good morning. Morning, everyone. And a very warm welcome to Broadby Baptist Church today. It's a pleasure to see you all here. Uh, my name is Dylan. I'm a member of the church here, and I'm going to be um, sort of guiding us along this morning um, for, for what we're doing. Um, I'd especially like to welcome um, any new students. It's September, so lots and lots of flux and change in the church, but just a very, very warm welcome, especially if you're a student. I'm conscious these couple of weeks for a student are pretty intense, uh, pretty busy, quite stressful. So it's just wonderful to see you here um, and just have so many, yeah, so many new faces. Um, Ben, one of our student workers, is going to come up a little bit later and just explain a little bit more about what student work is going on at the church. So you'll be able to find out a little bit more from him later. Um, and just generally, again, in September, we end up often with lots of people changing jobs, lots of people moving. So if you're new here for other reasons, as well as, being, as, well as students, you're very welcome as well. Um, and this morning especially, I'd just like to encourage the, the members of Broadmead who are here usually just to be wonderful hosts this morning to people who are visiting. Um, we've got lots and lots of exciting things going on here at Broadmead um, in the life of the church, and there's a few notices from people um, just to mention. I think John, actually, I'll, I'll invite up first, if that's all right. Yeah, great. Um, so um, thank you for everyone who prayed for Mark, who is our, our lead pastor. Um, he had an operation on Friday, and praise God, it went really, really well. It went about as well as it could have gone. So he, he got home yesterday. That was two days earlier than they were expecting. Um, they did what they needed to do in the operation, and it was much less intrusive than they wanted. So that's um, than they wanted, um, than they thought it might be. Uh, <laughs> they didn't want it to be intrusive. Uh, so that's really good news. Uh, do be praying on for him, because um, he's in a bit, a bit of pain, and pray that he recovers quickly. Um, but thank you so much for your prayers. I'm John, by the way. I'm uh, one of the pastors here. <laughs> Actually, in fact, I, I'll just praise God briefly now for that. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your faithfulness to Mark. And um, we just praise you for this situation that actually you have exceeded what we all expected you to do. Um, so we thank you for that, Lord. I pray for an ongoing swift recovery for him now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I think James is going to come up. Oh, there we are. Great. Hello. Sorry. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm James. Uh, I just want to tell you about an event that's happening at our church um, on the 29th of September um, from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, in the Wadlow Hall, um, which is the Chinese Painting Workshop. Um, we see this as a really good opportunity, whether you like art or you like learning about other cultures, um, please come along to this uh, event um, and just, yeah, let's share together um, and have a good time. Um, I just also want to make you aware as well of the Mercy Ministries prayer group meeting, which is meeting on Thursday night. We will be having dinner and then praying about um, homelessness within our city and the work of the Bristol Church's shelter. Um, so if you're interested in that, come and find me um, after the service. And if you're interested in the Chinese painting workshop, come and find me or Carol, who is um, in a grey jumper at the back there. Um, okay, thanks very much. Um, just Annabelle as well. Hello, I've got a couple of notices about hospitality um, that's happening in the next month or so. So in October, we are having Hospitality Month, which is a month where lots of different people across the church will put on events, which anybody can sign up to come along to. Um, so today is the last day to sign up to host an event. There's a couple of examples up there. I hear there's also some exciting things going on, like chess and chilly nights um so if you could if you are able to sign up to host an event then please do so I don't, we'll just leave that slide up on the screen while i'm talking so that you can all scan that qr code and sign up but we're also starting sign ups to attend this week so some of the events that have already uh, kind of been planned there's posters up for them over on that wall and a couple of us will be over there kind of selling tickets for those almost after the service if you'd like to sign up to attend please come and see us over there uh, and the other thing that's happening is church lunch next week. So next week we'll all be eating together after the service. It's uh, free, open to all. You're all welcome to attend. Please do come and eat with us. Uh, there was a great lineup of cooks, but if you are able to help with set up, clear up, or bringing something sweet, then please come and speak to me or Corrine after the service. Great. Thank you, Annabelle. I heard great things about the chess and chili night, just putting that out there. So if, uh, sign up quickly if you're into chess. 
Um, as we come now to uh, worship God in song, um, I'm just going to read a passage from, uh, from Revelation. We've been going through the Bible in two years as a church, so we're working through the whole Bible. We've been doing it for a year now. We're in Revelation for the New Testament, and I'm just going to read yesterday's passage from, from Revelation 7, um, and Ted's kind of got it up on the screen there, and it's in the New Living Translation version um, for this. Um, so from verse 9 onwards, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They're clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshipped God. They sang, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the 24 elders asked me, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said to them, sir, you're the one who knows. Then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They've washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. For the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. I mean, as we come to worship God, there's lots that we could talk about in that passage. Um, and actually, one of the songs we're singing this morning is essentially just singing that passage out together. But as we come to worship God and give him praise and give him, give him the, the glory that he's due, um, I just wanted to think about a couple of things. So why, why we can come to, to worship him boldly. Um, in that passage, it talks about the, the saints being made um, clean by the blood of a lamb, their robes being washed clean. Um, and I thought as we come to worship, let's just take a moment, maybe 30 seconds of just silence, just to, to think about what Christ has done for us on the cross and that by his blood we are saved. If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, you can come and boldly worship God because of what Christ has done for you. So let's just take some time now. Let's just be in silence and I'll pray briefly at the end. Heavenly Father, I thank you that it's by the blood of Christ that we have been saved. I thank you for his sacrifice. I thank you that he was the lamb that was slain. And Father, I, um, we acknowledge our sin to you. We acknowledge how far short we fall, Father. But I thank you that um, our relationship with you does not pe depend on what we have done, but on what Christ has done for us. Father, we thank you for this. Amen. Amen. Um, the second thing I just wanted to, to point out was um, just the fact that throughout Revelation, there's groups of people constantly just shouting out praise to God. I love in the NLT version, it says that they roared. <laughs> it wasn't just shouting, it was roaring praise to God. Um, and actually, lots of the lyrics we're singing today, we're going to be joining in with that worship. And I want to encourage us that as we, as we stand and we praise God today, that we're not just standing on our own. We're not just here as one church praising God, but actually we are joining in with the heavens who are constantly praising God. And we're joining in with other churches around Bristol, around the UK, around the world, who this morning are, are giving praise to our glorious God. So let's stand now. Um, we're going to sing, and um, I'll pray for us as we do that. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you're worthy to be praised. And I pray this morning that as we, as we give you glory, as we honor you, that you will meet with us, that we can enjoy your presence, that we can enjoy um, just the riches of your love this morning as we, as we give you honor. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God Almighty. 
Father, praise and honor unto you, the only one worthy of our praise. 
We thank you that through Christ you have made a way. I thank you through the blood of the Lamb you have made a way for us to be right with you, to be near to you, to be in your presence. We pray this morning that as we read your word, as we hear your word being preached to us, as we pray, Father, you'll meet with us, that you'll encourage us, you'll build this church for your glory and for your kingdom. Father, I pray as the young people and children leave, go to their groups, Lord, may you teach them, give wisdom to their leaders. I pray that they can learn to glorify you as well. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. So, children and young people will head out now. So, let me see if I get this right. Someone shout at me if I'm wrong. So, Crash and Sparklers this way, not into the music band as we learned previously. So, in the side door there. And then Explorers and Connect going off this way. And while they're doing that, have a chat with someone near you who um, you haven't met before and just get to know someone a bit new. Great. We'll bring those conversations briefly to an end, but please continue them after the service um, with some coffee. And I'm just going to invite Ben up to um, talk to us a little bit about student work and what, what the plan is going forward. Morning, everyone. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to use the pulpit. It feels a bit... I'm not doing this as a power play or anything like that. Um, for those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Ben. I'm helping to lead the student group here at Broadmead Church. And if you haven't noticed recently, past few weeks, we've come to the time of year when temperatures are getting a bit colder and nights are getting a bit shorter. But also university students are slowly coming back across Bristol and across the country, many for the first time. And if you're a student here, then particularly warm welcome to you. Uh, we're really glad you're here at Broadmead as a church. We love having students as part of our church family, and we just really want to help you make the most of your time in Bristol. So one of the ways we do that is through our, our student group, which runs on a, on a Sunday um, after church. Uh, I believe there's a notice. There we go. And we really have um, three main goals as, as a student group. We want to help students grow as, as followers of Jesus, so helping them to become more like him in their daily life, whatever that may be. We also want to help students to grow in their love for the local church. We think that's a really important part of Christian life. And we want to help them as much as possible to get stuck in serving uh, God's people. And lastly, we want to help to equip students just to boldly share that message of Jesus and his gospel, of his death and resurrection 
to those around them, whether that's to family, to friends, or just across campus. And just to give it a bit of a brief picture of what that might look like on a Sunday, we'll meet at around 1.15 p.m. Uh, just after church for some lunch, which will be provided for us. Um, then our, our real focus for, for that time is just opening up God's Word, We'll study the Bible together, and then we'll, we'll pray for each other in smaller groups. Uh, typically, we would, we would work our way through particular themes or books of the Bible. Uh, and this year, we're starting with a short series, basically going back to basics and exploring what the gospel is, what it means, and how it applies to our lives today. Uh, beyond Sundays, we also really want to give every student the opportunity to read the Bible with uh, an older Christian in a one-to-one -one setting. Uh, we just believe that is a, a great way to study God's word more deeply. You can really take your time going through the passage, um, ask each other questions. Uh, but it also just helps getting to know other people in the wider church family so you don't feel like you're stuck in a student bubble. Our student group is actually meeting today uh, for the first time this year. So if you're interested in checking us out, uh, do feel free to come along. Like I say, we'll, we'll probably congregate around the piano at 1.15ish. But if, I'm gonna if you just sort of see a group of students that look like students and they kind of gradually get towards that door, just follow them and, and you won't really get lost. So hopefully I'll see you there. Great, thank you, Ben. And then there's just one more notice as well that I had forgotten about women's brunch. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Carol from Women's Ministry. Yeah. And for the coming event, is, which is the Women's Welcome Brunch. Yeah, this morning I see a lot of new faces, uh, ladies. <laughs> yeah, um, I would like to introduce um, the ladies uh, from church. Uh, if you are new or just feel new to church, um, it's a great opportunity to uh, get to meet others and uh, chat over delicious food. And the date is uh, the September 28th uh, from 10 to 11 half. And the place is Marshman Room, which is the second floor. And if you would like to join us, uh, the only thing to do is to sign up. Yeah, sign up the Google form. Uh, okay, then see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so uh, Walter's going to come and lead us in a time of prayer now. Great. And then Maeve's going to come and do the Bible reading after that. Morning, I'm Walter. Quite, quite high here. <laughs> so, um, let me see. Uh, let's, uh, I remember last time when I come over here to pray, it's like just like 70 people, less than 100. Now it's over double its size. And I remember last time, last week when Mark pray, um, preached, he says in, when Jesus come, while we all in heaven, it's like, we all people come from all nations. It's like brought me church now. So let's pray together. Together. The book of James teaches us that is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. Heavenly Father, we pray for the um, two years uh, Bible reading plan. Please inspire us through your spirit and help us understand your word better. Thank you, God, for Mark's successful operation. We ask for a quick recovery for him. We also pray for our elders, deacons, church workers, and home group leaders. Please keep them strong, both physically and spiritually, as they serve you. Lord, we pray for our student community. Help returning students feel refreshed and guide new students to settle in quickly. God, we ask for your help in the upcoming members meeting. Guide us to make the right decisions that bring you glory. We pray for the peace all over the world, especially return to the Middle East. Lord, when your word is preached, um, we pray for John who preached his word for us. Uh, may we understand it, we keep it in our hearts, and live it out in our daily life. 
when the Bible teaches us who should separate us from the love of Christ, should, should trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sore. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor neither um, height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we all pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Morning, everyone. We are reading Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, which if you have one of these Bibles or a blue one, it's on page 1, 2, 3, 4, which is quite nice. Okay. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you who have this in your favor, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. To the, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give them of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, 
whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay you according to your deeds. Now, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give them, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what time I will come to you. Yet, I, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them a new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. To be, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the person who is, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'll, I'll just pray um, before, before we open this. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we, we praise you for this opportunity to come together as your people to worship you. And Father, we pray that as we um, think about what you've said here to your church um, and to us today, we pray that you'd speak in power. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. A few, uh, a couple of practical things. Uh, the student meal is free, and also um, the hospitality stuff is also free. Um, just to clarify that. Um, welcome, if you're new, uh, particularly. Um, we're so glad that you're here, um, and also, obviously, if you're you've been coming for ages, you're also very welcome. Um, uh, just a little bit about what we're doing. Um, we are a community of people who love Jesus. Um, Together, um, we want to reach out for the city and the world beyond that. And we meet together because Jesus has changed us. We've encountered him, and that has been amazing. And um, we are a community that's really excited about the Bible, um, about encountering Jesus in the Bible through the Holy Spirit together. And so over the last couple of years, it's been mentioned a couple of times already, we've been going through the Bible um, over two years. So we've got a reading plan, which involves reading a couple of chapters a day. And we've been doing that together as a church, which means we've been, kind of had this ongoing conversation in home groups um, uh, and just in church life generally about the whole Bible, um, which has been amazing. Also challenging, because the Bible is a big, complex, hard book. Um, but it's been great because in that we have seen Jesus. Um, and the reason we're doing that is um, because we want to encourage people to get into a daily discipline of reading the Bible. Uh, but we're doing it mostly because we want people to, to meet Jesus. And the Bible is, is key to that. And that's changed the way we do our preaching series. So before we started doing this, we would tend to just go through one book of the Bible at a time um, and really dig into it quite deeply. But over the last um, year or so, we've been going at a much quicker pace. Um, and this term, we're going to be doing mini-series in books of the Bible. So we're currently in one on Revelation. Uh, so last week, we looked at Revelation 1 and the vision of Jesus Christ that's there. And today, we're looking at two chapters, Revelations 2 and 3. And Revelations is weird to a 21st century audience. Um, and it's weird because it's a genre that we don't really have. It's actually three different kinds of book. Uh, the first one is apocalyptic, uh, which no one writes in in 21st century Britain. Uh, an apocalyptic book is a, a book that describes hidden heavenly realities using symbols. So numbers are really important. And also, there's kind of quite powerful, complex visual images that are often quite bizarre. Like, they'll have beasts with loads of different horns on, or loads of different heads, um, and they'll be made up of loads of different animals. Um, and and it, it, it's, it's quite confusing to us. But back then, it was just a genre of writing. People were used to that. So it's apocalyptic. It's also um, a prophecy. So it's, John says very deliberately at the start, he says, this is stuff that's going to happen. He's saying, thus says the Lord, this is the word of God, for now and for the future. And it's also a letter. Um, and it's a letter to the seven churches that are in um, Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And these seven churches are kind of like on a circuit. You can see it there. Um, so Patmos is where John was kind of writing this from. And you see there's churches, and if we go clockwise from the bottom left, so Ephesus is the first one, which is kind of like the, the biggest um, city of the region. Then Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And John would have known that circuit because he was kind of like the boss of those churches. 
he, he was serving them, so he would have gone on that route lots of times to visit them and, and check how they were doing. And there's loads of local detail in these letters um, that we're looking at today. But the number seven is significant. There are seven churches, but actually, there were more than seven churches on that route. And he hasn't necessarily gone for the biggest cities. He's chosen seven because seven is a significant number. It represents universality, like the totality. So he's writing to these local churches, yes, but he's also writing more broadly. And he's very self-consciously in Revelations, kind of finishing the Bible off. If you read the last chapter of Revelation, it's like, wow, this is definitely the end of the book. And John does that deliberately. And he says repeatedly in this, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Whoever. So the sense in which, yes, this is an ancient document written in a genre that, that we don't really use very much anymore, so it's a bit difficult to understand. But there's also a sense in which it's very immediate. It's a letter, and it's a letter that he wrote for us. Today, here and now. And we're going to look at all of these letters today, these, over the, these couple of chapters, and we can't go all of them in detail. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick out common features. And that's quite easy because the way they're structured is actually very similar. It's like there's a template, a pattern that he repeats. And I'm sure you've noticed that in the readings. And this matters because it tells us something about what church is, who we are as a church, how Christ sees us, what matters to him when he looks at his church. And I don't know how you see church. You've come here this morning. Uh, presumably you knew it was a church when you walked in. Um, maybe you've been coming to church your whole life. Maybe you have a warm glow when you kind of sit in a church. But maybe church has really hurt you. In fact, probably. That might be true on a global level. I mean, if the, you haven't been hurt by the church, big C, across the world, then you probably haven't been listening. Just this week, I heard a, a, another scandal about a church in the Jesus Army. And actually, that was a, a church group that I encountered when I was young and had really good experience with. But then, not just on that kind of big picture level, also... People here this morning will have been hurt by church, and maybe this church. Certainly, you will have experienced pain in a church context. And Jesus, in this kind of message to the churches, he doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't present the church as this kind of sorted thing. He's real about the problems. He knows. And that makes what he says really compelling and really important. And what we're going to see is basically um, the glorious Christ, he knows his church, he knows us, and he calls his church to overcome. So first of all, uh, the glorious Christ. Um, and it's worth having it open. Isn't it great that it's one, two, three, four? Best page numbers ever. Uh, so it's worth having an open on that, uh, just so you can check that I'm not making this up. Um, so uh, the, the, the first thing that's said in every letter is, these are the words of. These are the words of. Him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. The symbolic imagery. He, he holds the churches in his hands, is what that's saying. Him who's the first and the last, who died and came to life again. The words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. The words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. The words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. That's the starting point of every letter, because that's the starting point of the church. The church is not an institution or a set of institutions, primarily. It's not beliefs. It's not structures. It's not programs. It's not ethics. The church is a community of people who have seen Jesus, who have received him, who follow him. And you cannot make sense of the church without making sense of Jesus Christ. And that's the starting point. And, and why uh, these churches expect to listen to what is said to them is because of who is saying it. Jesus, their Lord, their Savior. And they should listen because of who he is. This is 
God in all his majesty speaking to that which is his. And it's significant that these are the words of Jesus. Jesus speaks. We're here today because we have heard what Jesus has said, and we found it compelling, and it's changed us. So we're not defined by our programs or our people or our beliefs or our practices. We are defined by Jesus Christ. And who he is really matters. And this is a big preoccupation of the first five chapters of Revelation. So, Revelation 1, you have a vision of Jesus. These letters contain lots of vision of Jesus. Um, And actually, these intro words are all drawn from the vision in chapter 1. And then it kind of escalates. In in chapter 4, the cast list grows. There's a massive chorus of praise to God. And then in chapter 5... It kind of leads up to this big revelation of Jesus, this big moment, this climax where he is revealed. And it's central to this. In a sense, this is part of that larger story of Jesus being revealed before we have uh, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, um, and lots of other kind of imagery. So the glorious Christ, he knows us. He knows his church. One of the repeated phrases is, I know. I'm not going to read them all because of time, but in every letter he says, I know. I know what's going on. And he also says quite often, yet I hold this against you. Jesus knows the good stuff, and he knows the bad situations that people are in, churches are in, and he knows the bad behavior that they are doing. He knows. And repeated refrain is repent, change, turn. And there's only two of the churches, um, Smyrna and Philadelphia, about which no negative things are said. And it's interesting, both of those churches are churches that are under the cosh. They're suffering. They're finding it hard. And there's two churches about which no positive things are said. And that's um, Laodicea and Sardis. And both of those are complacent. They think they're sorted. Now, we haven't got time to go through it all in detail, but we can see from this that Jesus approves of in Ephesians hard work, perseverance, intolerance of wrongdoing in the church, testing teachers, enduring hardship in Smyrna. He approves of faithfulness in Pergamum, staying true to his name. In Thyatira, love, faith, service, perseverance. In Philadelphia, they kept his word, they didn't deny his name, they endured patiently. And we can see that he disapproves in Ephesians that they'd lost the first love. In Pergamum and Thyatira, he's upset they're tolerating wrong teaching. In Sardis, he he sees their complacency and doesn't like it. And Laodicea, he sees their arrogance. So Jesus sees. And the point of this is, Churches have a collective identity. We have a collective identity. We operate as a whole in some senses. And Jesus knows us. Now, these letters contain lots of personal detail about the cities they're in and about the situations they're in. And Jesus knows all of us. He knows the situations that we're dealing with. He knows what Bristol is like. He knows where you live. And, and how you live, what matters to you, what your fears and your hopes and your dreams are. And he knows about that about us collectively, together. And that's a real comfort. Jesus knows what you're going through, and he cares, and he loves. He knows what we're going through together, and that matters to him. But it's also really challenging Because time and time again in this, Jesus says, I hold this against you. Repent. Change. Something isn't right. Something's got to be different here. And one of the main things he is unhappy about is is complacency. So the glorious Christ knows us, and he calls us to overcome. Again, a repeated refrain is, to the one who is victorious. 
And there are different rewards for this. So um, in Ephesians, to, to Ephesus, sorry, um, I'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To Smyrna, the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. They'll be given some of the hidden manna. They'll be given a white stone with a new name on it. They'll be given the morning star. Their name will never be blotted out from the book of life. They'll be given white clothes. They'll be given them a new name. They'll be given the right to sit with Jesus on his throne. There's rewards. And that comes to the person who's victorious. And that word victorious is really interesting. It's really important for John. And it's, um, it's Nikao. It, Nikao? I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it. Um, but it's where we get, you know, the, the athletic sportswear brand, Nike? Yeah? Um, Nike, with a tick. Um, that is named after Nike, the Greek goddess of victory. And the word Nikao is, basically means victory, to be victorious, to overcome, to prevail against some kind of situation. And the Nike tick is actually quite good evocation of this because there's a down, there's like the, the difficulty, and there's the kind of prevailing, you know, quite, it's quite clever. Um, and again, it's very appropriate for athletics and sport because sport is about overcoming. So, so Nike would have been this goddess um, who people, if they were going to battle, they'd pray to her. And if they won the battle, they'd be like, oh, thanks, Nike, that was great. Um, and they'd hold temples to her. Uh, and it was also that she was the goddess of athletes. So if you're into athletics, before you um, had a race, you might sacrifice to her, and afterwards you might give her thanks. So the point of this is, in Revelation, it's a really important term. It's really important, this idea of conquest, of victory, of overcoming, of prevailing. But what John does is he subverts it, he twists it. He doesn't leave it as that kind of domination sense. It's bound up in Revelation with the person of Jesus Christ. The victory, the conquest, the overcoming is his. It belongs to Jesus. And the first five chapters that we talked about is, is kind of building a sense of, of expectation, a growing crescendo of praise to Christ. And there's this moment when there's an awful problem because there's this scroll that's got seven seals on and no one can undo the seals. They're really hard to... And, you know, what are we going to do? And then this is the big moment of, like, wow, Jesus. And what happens is... One of the elders says, don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. You're expecting a lion, right? You're expecting the, the ultimate representation of athletic strength, strength of, of danger, of violence, really. And what you get is a lamb looking as if it had been slain. What John is saying is that Jesus Christ is victorious. He is the conqueror. He is the overcomer. And he is not a lion killing. He is a lamb slain. Jesus overcomes through his own death. His crucifixion has this beautiful, supernatural, spiritual power and, and the overcoming that happens overcomes through and in that suffering death. A lamb is like one of the weakest things, isn't it? It's so vulnerable. It's so, so yeah, prone to, to, to death. I mean, they look adorable as they jump around. But, but, but shepherds have to protect them. Because they're vulnerable. And being slain is the ultimate kind of vulnerability there is. It's, it's defeat, isn't it? It's not conquest. It's not overcoming. It's not prevailing. But the Jewish readers of this would have understood that the lamb wasn't just a, a lamb that died, but it was a sacrifice. And the point about sacrifice is that it, 
it achieves something. It means something. If you lose something, you've lost it. It doesn't mean anything. But if you sacrifice something, you give it up to gain something better. Jesus Christ, he sacrificed his own life. He gave up life itself for us in order to gain us because he loves us. That is the conquest. That is the overcoming. That is the victory of Jesus Christ. He took our sin and in his death, he gave us life. And John is overcome by this. He can't, he can't get enough of it. It blows him away. And this victory of, of loss and of death and of suffering is, is crowned by this resurrection in which he raises to life. And it demonstrates that there's power in this death. So in the Revelation, the church is victorious. There's no doubt at all about that. But it's not in strength. It's through weakness and it's through suffering. Jesus is all powerful in heaven in Revelation. He has glory, he has power, he has authority, and that is demonstrated most clearly, most powerfully, most beautifully in his lambness, in his slainness. And this is John's favorite title for Jesus. Throughout Revelation, he's referred to as the Lamb more than anything else. And the church overcomes not by being strong and powerful, but holding on to and being faithful to Jesus by following him through suffering. And that's hard. So what does this mean for us? Well, who are we? (laughs) We are people who have seen this vision of Jesus Christ. The God of glory who who left it all behind to suffer and die because he loves us, to save us. We have seen that and we have heard his voice. And we are defined by that lamb who was slain. He won victory through weakness and suffering. And being a Christian is accepting that Christ in his weakness is all the strength that we need. We are broken and bruised. We know guilt and shame, and that ruins us. And Jesus died for us in our weakness, in our guilt, in our shame, to redeem us from it. And that invitation to receive that is always open. You might be here this morning, this might be news to you. That's brilliant. (laughs) We, We want this place to be a church where people come here who, who don't believe this, who don't get it, who are just like, what's a church? You're so welcome and you're invited. And receiving this strength of Jesus in his weakness, overcoming with him is about turning, turning away from the wrong that you've done and turning towards Jesus and his goodness, trusting that this death and this resurrection has power. Please come and talk to me or whoever you came with or someone else after that to the service if you'd like to talk more about that. We're also called to overcome. Seeing Jesus and hearing him defines us, as I've said. And he calls us in this passage, in this two chapters, to overcome, to be victorious. But that is not something we achieve in power and in strength. It's the lamb who was slain who defines us. And that's important because in some senses, times are hard for the church. In the UK, globally, the church is is growing. But in the UK, it's shrinking. And it can feel to Christians like we're a bit under the cosh, a bit uncomfortable sometimes. It's hard to hold to Christian sexual ethics. Perspectives on gender. Perspectives on money and, and generosity, on receiving the alien and the stranger. And it's tempting, in that kind of context, to think the answer is more power, 
more strength to fight, you know, to, to, to get in a corner and be in battle, to win the war. But guys, it's normal for the church to suffer. It's not normal, it's not right for the church to dominate and win with strength. The two churches here that Jesus looks at and loves and and approves of what they're doing, he loves them all, are the two churches that suffer, Smyrna and Philadelphia. There's a saying, the blood of martyrs, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Jesus doesn't call us to seize power, but to give it up. He didn't call us to compel people to behave in a certain way, but to call them to repentance. And that is incredibly powerful, just on a psychological level. There is something incredibly powerful in seeing people believe something and suffer for it. And that's well attested, just on a purely psychological level. If you're willing to suffer something, well, you really believe it. Maybe it's really true. And that was incredibly powerful in the the early church. Martyrs, people willing to die for Jesus. But it's more than that. It's not just, oh, that's a good psychological trick. That is the whole basis of Christianity. Strength through weakness through suffering, through Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, bloody and beaten and dying, tortured on a cross. And that has spiritual power that we can attest to here this morning. Every believer here can attest to that power. Redemption, forgiveness, a new start, a new hope, a new life. And no, it's not always easy. Of course not. But there is joy and there is fullness of life, even in the midst of the pain. And we are called in this letter, in these letters, in a sense Revelation is one big letter, to overcome by perseverance through hard times, by faithfulness to Jesus Christ in hard times. And I'm not going to say that's easy. Now, the context of Revelation is a hard time for the church. And, you know, you can kind of see things are getting harder for us here, but we still have loads of blessings, loads And actually, living as a Christian is not all doom and gloom. Obviously not. Jesus tells us how to live and is life to the full. But Christian living is laying down our lives, even in times of relative material comfort. And in a big perspective, we are are not persecuted. But these letters, we're going to finish here, don't worry give two things to help us through this, to persevere, to be strong, to stand up and be faithful. And one of those is the rewards. A new heaven and a new earth is coming. It's like a train that's already going very fast down the tracks. Nothing's stopping it. It's on its way. And you're standing by the line and you haven't got very good visibility because some trees or something are bending the track but you can kind of hear rumbling and occasionally the tracks kind of quiver and you know it's on its way. And the new heavens and the new earth, they will be glorious. They will be good. <laughs> Every tear will be wiped from their eyes. You'll be able to eat from the tree of life. You'll not be hurt at all by the second death. And it's worth, uh, we're coming up to Revelations um, 21 and 22 in a few weeks, but I'm just going to read a bit now, because it's so good. So this is Revelation um, 21. Actually, no, 22. We'll go from chapter 22. Um, It's on page 1250, 1250. This is a vision. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. 
The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will see him. They'll see his face, and his nail will be on their foreheads. There'll be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of a sun, for the Lord God will give them lights, and they will reign forever and ever. Now, that's picture language. I don't know what it's actually going to look like in, in the flesh, but I know that it will be glorious. And that vision is given to us to help us endure, to help us persevere. The other thing that is given to us is the vision of Jesus. And the vision here is one of, you know, the first and the last who died and came to life again. Eyes like blazing fire, feet like burnished bronze. It's impressive. It's Jesus in his majesty and his power. But the climax, climax of that, the culmination of that, where that's heading, is Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain for us. And actually, the more we understand who Jesus is, the more we see his glory and his majesty, the more we get that actually it's his death and his resurrection. It's his weakness and his suffering that gives us life. The more it will make sense for us to follow And it is life-giving. Laying down your life for other people is actually wonderful. It's not a doom and gloom thing. It creates a beautiful community. It gets you outside of yourself. It's the way we are made to live. Loving people. Being loved. And the final thing I want to say is the more we see Jesus, the more we'll be like that. If we want to overcome, if we want to persevere, if we want to hold on, we need to see Jesus. And I know for myself, one of the things I found really encouraging about this is just how creative John is in his terms for Jesus. It can be easy to, to get into a rut in the way that we think about Jesus, in the way that we pray to him, in the way that we worship him. But there is fullness and there is richness in the way that John describes him. Um, let's, um, and let's do that ourselves. I'll just pray as, as we finish. Father God, we, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain. Thank you that he is the first and last. Thank you that he died and rose again. Thank you that the sharp, double-edged sword that he has is the, his words, and that he wields it in love. Thank you that his eyes are like blazing fire and his feet like burnished bronze. Thank you that he holds his church. Thank you that he is holy and true, that, he, that he, he holds the key of David. Thank you that he is the amen, the faithful and true witness, that he rules over everything. And Father, we pray that you would give us the grace to see him more and more, and that you'd give us the grace to overcome in his name. Amen. We come to the end of our service now. We're going to sing one final song. Um, and what I just want to encourage you to do is that, that we, we don't want to leave church unchanged by encountering God's word and by encountering Christ. So I encourage you, there's going to be a prayer team in the back corner over there, make the use of that opportunity to pray with people, make the use of this opportunity to respond to what we've heard. Um, don't leave here. If you're feeling prompted to respond, make sure you make the most of that. Um, I'm conscious of time, so we're going to do a slightly abridged version of this um, final song. Um, and then, yeah, you're free to go. Mine are days that God has numbered I was made to walk with Him Yet I look for worldly treasure And forsake the King of Kings but mine is hope in my Redeemer.
though I fall, His love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing. I am His forever. My not is in times of sorrow, darkness not yet understood. Through the valley I must travel, where I see no earthly good. But mine is peace that flows from heaven, and the strength in times of need. I know my pain will not be wasted, Christ completes His work. is mine forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus and we thank you for this image of Jesus as the Lamb who was slain. We thank you that your power was shown to us through his weakness, through him laying down his life. And I pray that that truth will continue to transform our our minds and our hearts and our whole lives. May we live lives that reflect um, the love that you have shown us and the grace that you have shown us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. That brings us to the end of um, the service. I'm just, as we finish, just going to read one more passage. I just encourage you this coffee. Um, I think there might be snacks left, possibly, if they haven't all gone already. Um, there's lots of new people to talk to, so make the most of this opportunity. Um, I'm just going to read uh, this final passage from 1 Thessalonians. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.